Hey everybody, welcome to the Song Revolution Podcast, brought to you by Nashville Christian Songwriters. Nashville Christian Songwriters exists to empower Christian songwriters worldwide. I'm John Chisholm, and this podcast exists to bring you valuable songwriting insights, inspiration, interviews, and just all around good fun with some of the greatest songwriters, producers, arrangers, artists, and creatives, and beyond. You can find out a whole lot more about us at NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the show today. Let me ask you a few questions, okay? Does this sound like you? You've known for years that you love music and you've longed to get your songs out there somehow, but you just didn't know how to do it. You started playing the piano or guitar and writing when you were very young, maybe as young as nine or ten, and the feeling that God has gifted you just won't go away and just keeps bugging you no matter how old you are at this point. You may have written dozens and dozens of poems and lyrics and have notebooks hanging out in the closets and drawers and just nothing's happening with them and you feel the clock tick, tick, ticking. Maybe you're in your 40s, 50s, 60s, or beyond, and you're still wondering if God is big enough to use you and your songwriting to touch anybody's life on the planet, right? Well, if you resonated with any of those questions, this is the right show for you today because I'm going to be talking about how to become a successful songwriter, no matter how old you are. We're going to dig into the one mental shift that can mean the difference between obscurity and opportunity for you and your songwriting for the next 30 minutes or so, and it could be a game changer for you. If you could just get this one tool in your songwriting tool belt, it's going to make all the difference. It's a principle, a concept that makes all the difference when it comes to writing songs that can reach the world, and I just don't want you to miss it today, so stick around. And I also have a free download for you today that's a game changer that I'm going to be telling you about later in the show. It's a very specific tool that illustrates what I'm going to share that I've never seen anywhere else, and it's the basis of successful songwriting. Every pro that I know in Nashville uses this tool to create all these amazing songs that you hear, and could be the basis of your songs too, so stay with me, and I'll tell you how to get it. I started NCS three and a half years ago with the mission from the Lord to empower Christian songwriters worldwide. And today this podcast is almost up to 100,000 downloads and we've served over 100 premium coaching clients with many of them getting publishing attention and placing in song contests and getting songs recorded. We're so proud of our folks. We love our songwriters. And so congratulations to each of you. You know who you are. You know what's going on. Maybe we'll feature you in an upcoming show. We have almost 16,000 fans on our Facebook page. We've got groups with over 5,000 songwriters sharing their songs and becoming more creative and informed about real songwriting. And we've had songwriters fly from all over the world, including New Zealand, Norway, Canada, Ireland, Scotland, and even Arkansas to attend our weekend workshops. We've brought our songwriters up close and personal with people like John Mays, founder and a and director of Centricity Music, home of Lauren Daigle, Jason Gray, Johnny Diaz, Andrew Peterson, Is He Worthy, and more. We've connected our writers into pro coaching and writing opportunities opportunities with people like Kenna Turner-West, who has over 35 number one songs and counting as a Curb Word Entertainment full-time songwriter, the lady's a maniac, as well as getting their songs in front of our friends at Centricity, Lifeway, Worship, Word Music, and many more. Anybody who will listen. We've provided incredible opportunities for our songwriters to interact with world-class producers, publishers, and deeply connected clinicians like Tom Jackson, the live music producer who's worked with every Christian artist and band around, like Francesca Battistelli. I just love practicing her name. Phil Phillips, Craig and Dean, Lecrae, and dozens more, as well as General Marketplace and big name artists like Sean Mendez and Taylor Swift. God's called us to be a kind of bridge between aspiring songwriters outside the professional Nashville music business and to real publishing opportunities if they rise to that level of skill in their songwriting. And we've personally represented our writers as it was appropriate. You know, guys, I'm going to be real straight up with you. I never promise it, but I always provide it. It's like if you come through our programs and you really are rising to that level of songwriting, hey, we're going to get out there. We're going to beat the streets. We're going to make sure that our friends in high places know about you and your songs. But, you know, if anybody promises you that if you, if you give them a bunch 
bunch of money that they're going to go make you famous or get you a publishing deal or make you a star. You know, I, I think you should run screaming from those kinds of people because it just really is not anything that you can promise. People can work for you and, and you know, try to get it done, I guess, of course, but it's just not anything I promise. But if any of my songwriter clients begin to write at a level that I think they need to be heard for, it's always just kind of a thing I do. I go, I go uh, knock on some doors, and we've been getting some great publishing attention. Some of our writers uh, have signed publishing deals with us, and with uh, and have had other uh, publishing opportunities, won songwriting contests, and I'm, I'm so tempted to go into some of these stories, but I'm just going to refrain for right now. But it's working, you guys. The coaching is working, and it's exciting. And it, wow, just such a blessing to see these sweet people, uh, Jacqueline and Shalom and Trevor and Shirley. Uh, who else? I'm going to leave somebody out. That's why I didn't want to do this, because I don't have the list in front of me. Uh, Bob, oh gosh, so many other people who have just really grown so much. Congratulations, you guys. It's a lot of hard work. You've done it. You've been at it. And just... Wow, what a great thing to be able to represent you guys and to be in relationship as you fulfill your call. So, you know, we, we do help bridge that. We'll talk a little bit more about that maybe as we go. But God's called us to be kind of a bridge, you know, for those people that are completely outside the Nashville thing to actually figure out how this works. And I'm going to talk about that a lot in the show. But it all starts with the power of your song. And that's why we create resources and opportunities for you to grow in your skills. We know you have passion. We know you have a call. There's just no argument about that. We know that you long to be heard for this burning message of Jesus and worship and your personal testimony of how he brought you through life so far. And that's why we have great things like NCS membership. And before, you know, before we go any further, I want to invite you to join NCS membership right now if you're not a member already. Even if you already think your songs are ready to be published just as they are, you'll be surrounded with amazing songwriters from all over the world striving for the same goal that you are to get your songs heard, to fulfill this thing in your heart, to really impact the world for Jesus in whatever way you want to do that. At NCS Membership, you'll find a whole new loving and passionate community, songwriters who love Jesus like you do and who love worship and who want the best for you as you work to reach your goals. It's just a great, great community. We have a Facebook group for our members. We interact. We do some very special things each month. Uh, we have monthly master classes that are phenomenal with incredible clinicians. I do some teaching, it may be every other month or so, but we have great clinicians that join me and we dig into things like modern hymn writing, modern worship songs. Songwriting. We just did one recently on chord progressions that are being used in modern worship. So if that's interesting to you, we always archive the classes. And uh, they're live and interactive when we do them, but then we archive them. So you can go back and check those out. The monthly master classes, I think they're just phenomenal. And you couldn't find a master class like this for under 17 bucks a month anywhere on the planet with incredible guest teachers and so much information and inspiration to take you deeper into your calling. So just go to NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com right now, even while you're listening, and sign up for as low as $14.99 a month if you pay annually or just $16.99 a month if you pay by the month. And hey, that's only four Starbucks, right? You, you can exchange for going deeper into your passion for writing a great song. So do it. Just go there now and join today. And you know what? If you don't like it, I will offer you a 100% money back guarantee for a one month trial. If after one month you're thinking, okay, I want my $17 back, I want my four lattes, well, you know what? I'll do that for you just because you're listening to this show. You get discounts as a member on all that we do, and uh, you get the archive of all the monthly master classes to go back and check out, and access to the Freedom Members master class each month. And again, it's live, interactive, always fun and informative, and geared to your songwriting success. So, what's the number one tool that you need for successful songwriting? What's missing for you? 
keep your songs at an average level and how can you get it to start growing today? Well, before I reveal it and unpack it for you so you can start using it even today to ramp up your songs, let me tell you my story. I hadn't grown up in a Christian environment as a kid, but music was just an important part of our family's life. My mom and dad, uh, may they rest in peace, were hobbyist bluegrass country musicians who played guitar, keys, mandolin, fiddle, bazooki, uh, go look it up, banjo and harmonica. My mom, man, she could just play a, a pretty mean harmonica. I remember being at a community center one time years ago as a teen, and uh, she was just wailing on that thing, bending all the notes, doing melodies and stuff. And man, I remember getting tears in my eyes. There was my mama playing harmonica. My dad was really cool, and he he played uh, all the stringed instruments, mandolin, fiddle, bazooki, which I think is like a big mandolin kind of thing. Banjo, like the real kind of banjo, and... Um, he just he influenced me a whole lot just in my love for music so dad thank you so much for that he just loved all kinds of music and we heard everything in our house from flat and scruggs to mahler and i think that equipped me later in my life i don't think i could have appreciated it as much as a stupid little kid but it really equipped me later in my life to uh, have an eclectic music taste and work with writers who write all kinds of things so he passed down that general love of music. I still remember the first time as a child when I heard Bach's Toccata and Fugue in D minor. You know, it's the one that goes... Remember that? It's like just crazy, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's organ music as it ought to be played, right? I also remember hearing Wagner's Flight of the Valkyries, you know, for the very first time. And they, these things, you know, they're kind of memorable for me. It made an impression as a kid, all this, you know, highbrow kind of music. And, I, you know, I actually started college the first time I went. I've gone a couple of times. And I actually graduated. Uh, but the first time I went in as a classical voice major, and I thought I was headed for a career in opera as a lyric tenor, but I digress. The point is that I was steeped in music through my formative years, but had no idea how great songs got written even then. Uh, but then I had a gutter to glory salvation experience at 18 years old, and the first thing I wanted to do was write a song about it and share it with the world. And maybe, maybe that's you too. You know, maybe you've you've that's a, a big part of why you want to share your songs. But I had never cared much about composing. Uh, maybe I'd written one or two songs, or not not a lot. But I suddenly couldn't get enough of it. I soon had notebooks filled with my devotional lyrics and was writing the best little melodies I could figure out with my guitar using a few chords that Dad had taught me. I wasn't a really great musician, and I wasn't really devoted to it, but I knew just enough that I started piecing these songs together. And these were the days of the burgeoning Jesus movement and the charismatic movement. Jesus choruses were new, and I'd play little songs like Karen Lafferty's Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Remember that one? You might not. I mean, it's, it's really one of the seminal, one of the beginning choruses. And there was a guy with, uh, with Maranatha named Bob Cole. And he would write songs like, Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. Just sweet little songs out of the Jesus movement. We'd sing, pass it on, pass it on. And then our friends Kirk and Debbie Dearman's classic, We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. Hope I'm not breaking any copyright laws singing a little bit of those songs. I think it has to be 30 seconds before you get dinged for it. But these were the early years of the Christian music business. And it it really, I mean, I don't think anybody could ever have imagined, you know, what it was going to be like, like cavemen imagining, you know, spaceships. It's like, I don't think anybody really knew what this thing was going to turn into and even what, you know, what, what a business worship music was going to be. Thank you, Michael W. Smith and other people who kind of helped bring worship mainstream. But Back in the day, I'm talking about these were early years of the Christian music business. And in those days, gospel artists were on secular record labels, you know, for the most part. Uh, Mahalia Jackson, Ethel Waters, the Hawkins, and so many others weren't 
on strictly Christian labels. And the the I'm gonna I'm gonna be really brave here and say you know that that you know gospel music was considered more black gospel music. We didn't have a lot of Caucasian people doing this thing, right? I mean, there were hymnals and there was church music, but we didn't really have a lot of artists like we have now. It was it was more the realm of black gospel music, which is awesome and love it. And thank you guys so much for all that you've brought, you know, to this thing. Love, 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 love uh, gospel music. But all this would come later. And I, I look back and marvel that I wound up being any part of it through the development of the CCM and worship movements of the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And I'm going to share a little bit more about kind of how that happened for me and how we wound up getting to where we are, you know, right now. Okay, so let's go back to this moment that I came to Jesus and I just, all I really wanted to do was sing and tell people about it. And I didn't have any concept of what it would take to build a ministry or what real publishing was like or how to do demos. I didn't even know that word. That that word really, uh, it existed, but I didn't know it. And I didn't know anything about this world and could not have ever talked about caveman to spaceships, man. I, I would never have, a, have dreamed that I'd be sitting here talking to thousands of people on a microphone about how to write great songs and having have uh, had over 400 songs published and traveled the world and worked for these great companies and I know such amazing people but it, it, it's all a gift and it's all been the serendipitous will of God I mean I don't you guys just wish we could figure it all out but it's all been by his hand, I'm, I'm just telling you. But what a privilege it is to be able to sit here and talk to you about it. So anyway, so there I am, this little kid, you know, this powerful Jesus experience. And I just wanted to be heard. I wanted to get my songs out there, even though I didn't know those were the phrases we'd all be saying all these years later. But there I am uh, feeling all the, the things that maybe you're feeling now. I, I, I've got this passion to sing and write about Jesus because he's revolutionized my life. And that's why I named this uh, the Song Revolution podcast, because you need to start with the soul revolution in Jesus and then revolutionize your songs from average to amazing. I like that. I think I'm going to start saying that a lot. I had the same passion and calling and, and longing and hope to be heard just like you. And I had no idea that anything would happen. I mean, in fact, I'd really given up on it. I had I had found the courage at some point to send some songs to a, a Nashville publisher just once. And when I got the rejection letter a few months later after waiting and waiting anxiously for, for the word that they loved my songs and wanted me to come record in Nashville, I just pretty much swore I'd never set myself up for that kind of rejection again. And I didn't. I really didn't. I just wasn't going to do it. But then God tricked me into moving to Nashville because he had a plan. Sneaky God, right? Well, my wife, Donna, and I were newlyweds in 1983 before some of you were born. Uh, We've been offered a job in Nashville and had come here to take it when it fell through unexpectedly. We had 40 bucks, no place to live, and I think our spiritual gifts in the body of Christ at that time was waif. I think we just felt like we were abandoned and orphaned. We were waifs. That was our gift. And, you know, that was a long time ago. That was before the worship leading movement. And although I could lead songs, I was pretty green when it came to finding jobs and having any direction in life. I was just young and stupid. I can say that now because now I'm just old and stupid, (laughs) but I definitely was young and stupid in that day. I had served in four churches in the first three years that we were married. It's a wonder that we are still married, but that all ended badly somehow. That's just a weird pattern for me. I don't know if I'm a self-sabotager or what? Self-saboteur. I think that's how you'd say it, not sabotager, (laughs) but we decided to stay here and get real jobs. So I got a paper route making 60 bucks a week and uh, Donna got a part-time graphics job that didn't pay much more than that either. I don't know how we survived. But a few months into 1984, a friend named Billy, hey Billy, 
Thank you so much. Introduced me to an acquaintance of his, Gary McSpadden of the Bill Gaither Trio. I had no idea who Gary was, much less Bill Gaither. I just was totally uninformed. But Gary and Bill listened to a few of my fledgling songs, and I promise you guys, God must have stopped up their ears because they signed me to a small publishing company that they were starting. I don't know if they just felt sorry for me, or I don't know, maybe they saw potential, but... I jumped at the chance and began to write five nights a week, most weeks, and co-writing with as many people as I could. I still just couldn't fully appreciate what I'd stumbled into, and it definitely has much more meaning to me now in retrospect than I was capable of understanding back then. I I was just young and stupid. I just didn't know. So you'd think that I had it made, you know, sitting right there in the publishing house with with McSpadden and Gaither and the other songwriters that they were developing back in those days, that I'd just breeze into getting songs placed and just off to the proverbial publishing races, right? Well, not really. I remember vividly showing my songs to them each week and getting that blank stare back from them as they read my sweet, devotional, hookless lyrics. I mean, God bless you guys if you ever hear this show, Bill and Gary and Gloria and anybody else back in the day, um, Ron, man, the, the head of the publishing thing there. You guys were just your saints to me. I mean, the fact that you would you you wouldn't kick me out as totally talentless and a lost case, man. Thank you so much for doing that. I'm here today because of you guys. I'm standing on your shoulders and hope it doesn't hurt. But anyway, you guys were always kind, but they'd ask me over and over things like, "Who's going to care about this in a hundred years?" I can still see Bill Gaither's face. "Who's going to care about this in a hundred years?" Or where's the one big idea in this lyric, Gary would say. Or what's going to make anyone sing along with this? Well, I I eventually started asking myself those questions before I even showed them my songs and while I was writing them. But I have to be honest, guys, I still wasn't connecting the dots. I was still wandering around in my craft, not really knowing what I was doing, but writing strictly from my feelings and spiritual devotion rather than from the place of knowing how to craft great songs. I mean, I was deeply spiritual, man. I'm deeply in love with Jesus, trying so hard to to tell people about it, but I was just clueless, young and stupid and clueless and didn't know anything about what I was doing, and yet God had plopped me right down in the in the middle of this thing so that I could learn. And, and then it happened, a sort of epiphany that overtook me gradually. I mean, epiphanies, I guess you think of them as suddenly, but I think this one was a little more gradual. Can you have a slow epiphany? Maybe you can. I think I did. A slow revelation, maybe. I, I don't know, a gradual revelation, an epiphany that overtook me maybe a few weeks or months when I started to get it. I started to see songwriting differently, started to understand and implement the most important tool that you need, that you need right now to make this shift too, and that's this simple truth. Are you ready? Drum roll, please. I need a drum roll, somebody. Maybe we can fly that in in post on this thing. But here it is, okay? You ready? Okay, get ready. Here it is. Songs are more assembled than written. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again a bunch of times through the show today. Songs are more assembled than written. I'd never thought of that before. It had never occurred to me that people weren't going to care much about my passion for Jesus and the things I was feeling about him, the things I was trying to express in my little devotional songs. Now, These songs were precious to me. I felt like I was pouring my very heart and soul out in them, and and there were times that I hid the hurt that I felt when these amazing people, these giants in songwriting history, didn't get me or think my song was ready for somebody else's record. But then I just crossed over an invisible line in the sand. Something inside me clicked. And guys, I saw it. I I finally realized the Grand Canyon of difference between my sweet devotional songwriting and a well-crafted Christian song that was based on a powerful title or hook and a well-crafted lyric that supports it. All the questions that they would ask me 
finally kind of came into focus and I started crafting songs, building them instead of just feeling them. I took a giant stride in that season from emoting songs to building them, crafting them, assembling them. Songs are more assembled than they are written. And from that moment on, my songs took on new power. Gaither and McSpadden and many more started to pay attention to them. And before the first year was out, I had around 19 songs recorded and they hired me at the company to be a publisher and work with the other songwriters. Okay, full disclosure, I didn't even know what a publisher was. I was young and stupid. Maybe that's going to be the title of this show today. John Chisholm, Young and Stupid. But I eventually worked my way up to become VP of Publishing for Star Song Records, working with the Gaithers, Twyla Paris, Whiteheart, Newsboys, Petra, so many more that were on the label and worked with their publishing. I actually helped get Phillips, Craig, and Dean going and look back on the, those days with tremendous joy. Uh, just so happy for what's happened with those guys in the ensuing 26, 7 years. If you go back to their cassette, the first the first one they ever did, I got a little thank you because I had left Star Song to, to go work at Integrity Music, but I got a little thank you. So you can go back and you can find that. So that's, uh, that's just a joyful thing to look back on their amazing career and how they've impacted the world. And so, uh, so congratulations, you guys. But I went from there to Integrity Music where I managed 18 full-time songwriters, including Don Moen, who's changed the world, Linda Shazo, who wrote More Precious Than Silver and so many, other, so many other amazing songs, Paul Balash, and 15 others who've impacted the world in worship forever. I got to oversee over 200 pieces of product from children's songs to hymnals and all the Hosanna music albums that were recorded all over the world. And I was very sad when that season was over. I loved it. Loved my work at both of these amazing companies. But I used this one principle with the songwriters everywhere that I went, everywhere I was in leadership. I, I taught them, if they didn't get it, that songs are really crafted and built and assembled much more than they are felt or emoted spiritually. Now, listen to me, guys. That doesn't mean the writers don't feel anything when writing them or that they're not sincere or in faith or don't love Jesus or don't believe what they're writing. It's quite the contrary. What it means is that they and we've learned to channel the devotion into well-crafted songs. Curb Word Pro songwriter Tony Wood has had over 40 hit CCM songs and worship songs and counting, and he loves Jesus. Kenneth Turner West, a clinician for us at our weekend workshops and guest on this show, has about as many hit songs as Tony, and she loves Jesus big time too. Hey, I love Jesus, and I know you do. And the only difference between you and us is that you haven't caught this yet. You have to learn to communicate well in your songwriting. It just always amazes me that we so over-spiritualize Christian songwriting. I mean, I was there too when I didn't get it. I would pray and dream and fantasize about someone hearing and loving my songs. I would pray for God's will and swear I wasn't in it for fame or money or any wrong personal reason. I longed to be good enough as a Christian and please God and keep all the commandments so maybe he'd use me. But you know what? None of that helps you become a fabulous communicator with words and melodies. I mean, God wants to use you, honey, a whole lot more than you even want to be used. Your problem isn't that you're not a good person or don't have a calling. Your problem is that you're not learning what you need to learn to get out of being just a devotional writer, just in your own journals, to building and crafting the kind of songs that can really break through. Successful songwriting is high-level communication that's based on your ability to put ideas, words, and music all together to hit the ears and hearts of listeners. Every coaching client that I've worked with has had to wrestle with this principle and take their emotion and feelings out of it just long enough to see the craft for what it is. It's a skill and not an emotion in order to write successfully. They've all said in one way or the other that I didn't know, this is what my clients say, they, they've all said, I didn't know real songwriting was like this, but the ones who get it start crossing over the same line I did all those years ago, and they start dialing in their lyrics to actually connect with the listeners. I mean, you don't know what you don't know, right? 
How can you? There's a lot of areas in our lives where we're still young and stupid and need some more home training, and I'm helping you out a lot more today than you might think I am right now. And this is how you become a successful songwriter. Are you listening? I need another drum roll here. You start with a killer idea, a title we call a hook that will appeal to the largest number of people in the world. Then you craft, actually build or assemble the most incredible, original, thoughtful, or thought-provoking, hooky, singable, memorable, emotional, universal, and sticky lyric humanly possible to support that killer idea down to the very last syllable. Somehow, you also simultaneously pull together a melody that is also as incredible, original, thoughtful, or thought-provoking, hooky, singable, memorable, emotional, universal, and sticky as your lyric to form a marriage of the two that is nothing short of a match made in heaven that will sweep listeners off their feet and make them fall in love with it the second they hear the first notes of your intro. No small feat, but it happens every day in Nashville and all around the world where people learn what I'm telling you, songs are more assembled than they are written. And that's why I created a unique tool called the Song Builder's Blueprint that I want to give you today. It's a 10-page PDF that illustrates this principle like nothing I've seen before or since, and it's yours today absolutely free. I've never given it away until now because it's a key feature in my video course by the same name, the Song Builder's Blueprint, Six Weeks to Successful Christian Songwriting that you can get over at NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com. Now, it takes more than six weeks to get great at anything. Of course, there's not 10,000 hours in six weeks, but... This course breaks into a six-week format that gives you all the real tools that you need to learn to build songs instead of just emote or feel them, writing ineffectively from intuition instead of craft. It doesn't mean you lose any sense of devotion or worship or sincerity. It just means that you learn to channel all of that beautiful devotion and worship and sincerity into effective songwriting skills. So a whole lot more people are going to love and use your songs. That's what you really want. Let's just admit it. This free PDF shows you exactly what each line and section in your song should be doing, how the first line sets up the tone, theme, and setting of the entire song, and how important the second line is to support and clarify the first line. Then it shows you in a beautiful graphic design how each line flows from the one before and even points back to the line before it, building your case line by line and section by section. It's also got a great glossary of terms and explanations of principles that will open your eyes to the level of songwriting I'm teaching you here. Believe me, you'll never look at songwriting the same way again. You'll learn to listen to the radio and every song you hear on the TV or anywhere, movies, you'll you'll hear them differently. You'll understand what the writers were doing and how they did it so that you can do the same with your songs and win a lot more listeners. If you're a worship leader or worship songwriter, you will start seeing the patterns and skills that people like Matt Marr, Paul Blosh, Matt Redman, Geddes, and so many more use in writing songs like In Christ Alone, 10,000 Reasons and all the top CCLI songs that you know and love. And here's the thing. You can now take all the guesswork out of songwriting and get on with the calling to do it. No more wishing you could fulfill this call to be heard. No more confusion about where great ideas come from and how to write powerful songs that people love and want to sing over and over. All that's holding you back from real songwriting can be wiped out with this PDF and the video course that you can get right now to help you do this thing that you want so badly. You can grab them over in the store at NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com. I'm going to give you the link for the downloadable PDF in just a second. This video course contains my 35 years of songwriting success, all the principles and insights that I learned from the Gaithers and Gary McSpadden and so many others who mentored me personally to songwriting success back in the day. That's my job for you right now. I'll put the link in the show notes to the course as well as the link to the free download of the Song Builders Blueprint that I want to give you as my gift to encourage you. And the, the video course unpacks so much more, so I hope you'll go get it today and take some bold steps in your songwriting because that's what it's going to take. And so when I'm in a co-writing session with professional songwriters on Music Row or anywhere, even here in my house, we meticulously choose words that support the one big idea. We can wrestle for hours over one word and even get stuck on rewriting a line for the sake of just one syllable. And it all hinges on starting with a hook that's so good that it's sticky and irresistible. A lot of aspiring songwriters never spend real time crafting their songs and just want people to gush 
over to the fact that they actually wrote something, kind of like your kid who, you know, the, their first little watercolor pony, you know, and you put it on the fridge. And But we, we've just got to grow up and be better than that to be successful at anything. So I have a new article out this week on CCLI's site called worshipfuel.com I wanted to tell you about as well. If you don't know about it, uh, worshipfuel.com is a great site that I recommend, especially for worship songwriters. My article there is called Sticky Songwriting, Five Ways to Make Your Songs Unforgettable, in which I talk about finding great ideas and how to craft the hook to support it. You can find it at worshipfuel.com, along with some other great resources from Christian Copyright Licensing International, also known as CCLI. Great folks we love and support. Incredible ministry. So let's put a bow on this and try to make this step as practical as possible. I admit that this is as much a mindset and philosophical concept as anything, but the ramifications of it are immeasurable. The impact that mindset and philosophy has on creativity and output are completely underrated by people who want to bypass the thinking and go straight to the Grammys. But that's laziness gone to seed, as we say down south, and the people who are really writing hit songs use these principles every day, whether they identify them as such or or not. I found myself in the place of codifying the principles of songwriting for you and the thousands of clients we serve through all of our offerings here at NCS, even though a lot of people use them subconsciously when they're creating. I mean, that's the point of training, right? To get to the point where it's mindless. You don't have to think about what you're doing because you know it on such a deep level that it happens without thinking. That's called flow or peak performance. When you become so good at something, you don't have to stop and analyze what or how you're doing it. I remember years ago as a young voice student, the first lessons with my coach were so bizarre as she told me to stand with my feet shoulder width apart, pelvis tucked, ribs extended, chin up, chest out, shoulders back, breathe from the diaphragm, and then sing. I felt like I was contorted, and it was definitely awkward, and that's how thinking about the tools and principles of real song writing can feel in the beginning. But if you learn them and stick with them, they become second nature, and you don't think about them anymore. Have you ever felt like you hit the flow and were at peak performance levels in anything you were doing? I remember the first time I felt that up leading worship at what is now Bethel World Outreach here in Nashville. I remember the first time the singing wasn't about me or my performance anymore. That magical moment that I felt I could hit any note with magnificent control and ease and it was all because I didn't have to think about it and I had completely transcended the need to be accepted. It was a totally freeing experience that I'll never forget. Singing and worship leading became easier and easier after that breakthrough to flow and peak performance because everything I'd practiced over and over became part of me and became effortless. I'm not saying I don't have to stay in shape or work at it, but I had broken through to a new level and would never have to go backwards from then on. And that's what happened in my songwriting too that I've been talking about when I had the epiphany about how to build songs instead of depending on my feelings, emotions, and intuitions about how it all worked. I could be more objective take my self-worth out of the equation and realize that I was learning to communicate on a pro level and not just share my devotional feelings. So if that's what you want, I'd like to work with you. There's all kinds of publishing opportunities if you know where to look for them and if you're writing at the level publishers and artists are really looking for. There's never been a better time to be a Christian communicator and our coaching is designed to help you learn what you need to learn to do what you want to do. We take the guesswork out of the business side of things and help you cut off years of roaming around around in the dark about how it all happens. Our weekend workshops bring you right in touch with the people who make it happen every day, and our group and personal coaching options are unparalleled and up-close and personal opportunities to do this thing. If you're ready to lose the excuse that you can't get a break and don't know the right people in Nashville, go to our site at nashvillechristiansongwriters.com and just read about all we offer there to equip, train, and empower you to be a successful Christian songwriter. If you don't think you need to learn and grow to be better, we can't help you. If God gives you direct downloads and all you need is promotion, well, we can't help you. If you blame everyone else for why you're not successful, we can't help you. We're looking for eager, hungry, teachable songwriters who are ready to invest in themselves to work with. If that's you, hey, we'd love to talk. Your next step now is to download this free Song Builders Blueprint PDF as my gift to you at www.nashvillechristiansongwriters.com forward slash blueprint. And then go to the store at Nashville Christian Songwriters to read about and purchase the video course called The Song Builder's Blueprint, 
Six Weeks to Successful Christian Songwriting, and then get started on your way to assembling all those amazing songs. Lose the guesswork, lose the confusion, and get going on real songwriting today. Again, that free PDF of the Song Builders Blueprint is waiting for you at www.nashvillechristiansongwriters.com forward slash blueprint. Go get it now and then check out the video course under the store link on our site so you can get started now building fantastic new songs. Hey, thanks for being with us today on The Song Revolution, your podcast for breakthrough information and inspiration to fulfill your call to write songs that can change the world. I'm John Chisholm. Happy to be with you today. I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening in today on the Song Revolution Podcast. If you're wanting to take your songwriting to the next level, be sure to jump over to NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com right now to check out all the valuable resources that we have there for you, especially NCS Membership, where you can go deeper into a community of like-minded songwriters and tap into encouraging blogs, videos, powerful masterclasses, and a whole lot more to get you where you really want to go. I'll see you next time.